All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the 14th session of Foreign Affairs with Future Leaders. My name is Alad Raymond and I'm the Executive Director of the Onero Institute. I'm so thrilled to have you all join us here today for this session. We really have a phenomenal topic to talk about and some phenomenal speakers with us tonight. Um, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge all the organizations that helped make this event possible. Of course, uh, my own, the Onero Institute, uh, we have the Delta Phi Epsilon Professional Foreign Service Fraternity and Sorority at the George Washington University. We have Women in International Security at the George Washington University and the School for Ethics and Global Leadership. Uh, before we get started, uh, I just also want to acknowledge the individuals that were uh, essential in making this uh, event happen, especially I want to acknowledge Lucy Hale of the Delta Phi Epsilon Professional Foreign Service Sorority and Sofia Oliveros, of the, also an alumni of the Delta Phi Epsilon Sorority, um, as well as a Latin America and Brazil Associate at Kroll Inc. Uh, we have a great event for you all tonight, but before we get started and I turn over to our moderator, Sophia, I wanna go through some procedural information. Please be sure to show respect for all peers and all topics discussed. As always, be analytical and approach the material professionally. If you'd like to ask a question at any time, feel free to send a message uh, through the chat. Uh, please note that we're gonna be recording this session uh, so that Others can view it uh, late, later on. And of course, please keep your mic muted uh, and your video off well, so we can have the best uh, connection, the best experience for the event. And without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Sophia. Thank you all for being here tonight. Sophia? Thank you a lot. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so as the COVID-19 pandemic places even greater stress on the various delicate political and economic balances across Latin America, China remains an active player throughout the hemisphere. At this unique moment, the continuing role of China in Latin American affairs presents interesting challenges and questions for the future of the region. China has been an invaluable partner to many Latin American countries during the COVID-19 pandemic, providing much needed medical equipment, PPE, and vaccines to a region where the coronavirus has claimed over 700,000 lives. I am pleased to introduce our speakers today. All of them have really amazing bios. You can read them at the Inner Institute website, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna read their current titles. Today, we have Margaret Myers, the director of the Asia and Latin America program on the Inter-American-American -American Dialogue. Stephen Kaplan, associate professor of political science and international affairs at the Elliott School of Affairs, who happened to have been my professor at GW twice. <laughs> we have Paulina Garzon, director of the China Latin America Sustainable Investment Initiative, and Benjamin Gadan, Deputy Director of the Wilson Center's Latin America Program and the Director of its Argentine project, Argentina Project. So first, our speakers will give us a brief introduction about different as aspects of China-Latin America relations to help us further understand the current situation in the region. So first, we have Margaret. Thank you, Margaret, for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks so much, Sophia, for the for the kind introduction, and also thanks to the Onero Institute and, and, and partners for, for the invitation. I'm really quite thrilled to be here. Um, and also, of course, good evening to, to all of you in attendance. Um, I've been asked to make some very brief comments about the political tone of the China-Latin America relationship at present and on views of China and Latin America and vice versa. Um, as well as on the various actors responsible for carrying out the relationship. So let me just make a few, uh, you know, basic points, uh, which I'll hope to elaborate on in the Q&A if of interest. Uh, first of all, views of China um, really vary somewhat on a country by country basis in Latin America and even within countries, right? It's not uncommon, for example, for opinions among the elite in certain countries to differ from views of civil society actors or industry representatives, whether on China or on other issues for that matter. Um, and even within the business community, views of China vary considerably based on China's effect on specific sectors, right? So soy producers in Brazil have historically had very different views of China uh, and responses to Chinese activity in their country than many of Brazil's manufacturers, uh, for example. Uh, and in, in the case of China, if we're talking about Chinese perceptions, the sort of other side of the coin of Latin America, um, it's a it's difficult to to gauge this. There aren't a lot of you know very clear surveys of of uh, Chinese experts on this particular topic. But one can look at you know 
the region's um, inclusion in the Belt and Road is something of an indication perhaps of where China falls, or rather Latin America falls overall in, in, in terms of China's broader foreign policy priorities. And in that case, we saw Latin America enter the Belt and Road as sort of last, even as it was becoming a global initiative, and in fact falling behind uh, the Arctic in that list of, of, uh, of regions and countries that, that, uh, that joined the initiative. So it gives you a sense of, I mean, it's indeed a priority region in many, in many ways, uh, is looked at as, you know, as a, a destination for, a, you know, a very positive and, and interesting destination for a lot of investors. Uh, but sometimes a problematic one, indeed a very far away one, and one that is perhaps not the highest ranking overall. Um, back to the sort of uh, question of, of Latin American views. Um, in general, as most major polls have suggested as recently as 2019, views of China have improved on average over the past four or so years, especially when compared to views of the United States in Latin America. Uh, so that now over half of the population in Latin America views China positively, right, on average. Of course, there's variation, but on average, that's what we're seeing. Um, much of this, especially positive views of China vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., is perhaps a reaction to Trump administration, trade, immigration, and other policy in recent years, rather, rather than a, you know, a, a clear... Um, uh, sort of upgrade in in China Latin America relations or a, a clear you know boost in in overall views of China, um, but in other cases I do think that some of what China is doing, uh, its active participation in certain sectors, vaccine diplomacy, uh, and some of especially the, the sort of South South rhetoric that's espoused by China's leadership has indeed appealed to certain segments of the Latin American population. Um, and then finally, regarding the actors that are shaping China-Latin America relations, you know, looking at the wide range of activity taking place across the region, I frankly can't think of any subcategory of actors that isn't either actively shaping or else trying to shape uh, the relationship at present, whether we are talking about Chinese and Latin American businesses, uh, governments at various administrative levels, civil society, certain external actors even, right, and, and a range of others. And just to sort of underscore this point, uh, there isn't really a standard approach, right, to China-Latin America deal making. Um, we hear a lot about China going to the region and, you know, seeking out resources or, you know, looking for a strategic opportunity. Um, and that's happening, certainly, you know, that, but that tends to be sort of the dominant narrative. But, um, you know, even when China does this, their approaches are shaped by local conditions and regulations. It's also the case, and I think increasingly so, that some deals are struck at the behest of Latin American actors, right, including not only, you know, sort of federal government actors, right, but also mayors and, and, and governors in many cases who actively reach out to Chinese entities, companies in certain cases, uh, you know, trade associations and others um, in order to, to strike these deals rather than the other way around. And then there are, um, you know, the mini deals in the past, at least, that were part of major loan packages to Latin American governments. So there are wide ranging ways to strike deals in Latin America. And indeed, there are so many different actors involved in sort of reaching, you know, uh, various agreements. And of course, these actors shape, shape the outcomes of these agreements as, do, as, do, as does the regulatory environment and a wide range of other factors, political economy factors, right? Um, and then in, there are other forms of engagement, of course, especially in the diplomatic and quasi-diplomatic spheres uh, um, that are carried out by dozens upon dozens of Chinese and Latin American actors with sometimes different motivations. So indeed different types of activities and different outcomes based on who's doing what, right, at, at different levels in, in the Latin American region. And so I know I've probably even gone beyond my, <laughs> my brief uh, time, time frame. So I'll leave it there at this very you know, broad macro level. And I'm happy to focus more in depth on any of this in Q&A. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, that was super interesting. If you want to go ahead, uh, Professor Kaplan. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, tonight, actually, I just came from a Passover Seder. Uh, one of the things we do on this holiday 
is we ask four questions that basically come down to why is this night different from all other nights? I'm gonna add a fifth question, which is why is Chinese finance different from Western finance, right? Um, so effectively, um, I'm gonna basically start with some stylized points that look at you know, what China's been trying to do over the course of the last several decades and how their policy approach has also changed over time. I'll then kind of share a couple graphs with you to kind of reinforce these points uh, very quickly. If you've had me in class, you know, I love charts and graphs. So uh, try to keep it informal, but I can't help uh, but be tempted to at least share a graph or two. Uh, so in any event, uh, effectively, if we think of the history of China's economic ties within the region, it began with trade, right? It began with the WTO. And the main policy tool in a lot of the ways, because it was trade, was indeed during that time an undervalued currency, right? Where China used a cheap currency in order to promote their exports internationally. Now today, despite the fact during election campaigns that we often hear talk of currency manipulation and a cheap currency, they've actually changed their tools, right? And in fact, it's often a strengthening renminbi that's far more important than a cheaper renminbi. Why? Because now they become an international bank creditor, right? They're lending money internationally in order to promote exports instead. So the tools that China is using today are much more centered around their policy banks and policy banks using lending internationally as a way to stimulate trade ties, as a way to stimulate investment ties, as a way to uh, what I kind of call maximize markets, right? Uh, in the West, we often think of firms maximizing individual profits. In a lot of ways, right, I see what China has been doing over the course of the last decade or so since the global financial crisis within the region is a way of trying to build market presence over time. So then we can ask, okay, if the tools have changed, they're more likely to kind of use these policy banks as a way to stimulate uh, these economic relations. What are the costs and benefits of that, right? Compared to Western finance historically, that's more market-based, what happens when you have the state-led capital instead? Um, and so effectively, I think there is a trade-off, right? Uh, we know, right, that China tends to emphasize things like non-intervention, right, um, when they're lending internationally, meaning they're less likely to put policy conditions on their loans, such as you need to uh, balance your budgets or privatize, right, or deregulate the economy. Um, that being said, it doesn't mean that Chinese loans come without conditionality, right? Uh, and so effectively, there's a different kind of conditions that are commercial conditions, uh, where China, very similar to the tide aid historically, uses right, these loans, as mentioned before, as a way to stimulate trade, but also as a way to kind of build market share over time. Right? So we see contracts promoting uh, Chinese machinery, uh, Chinese local content. Uh, we see also, because they have this policy of non-intervention, don't necessarily want to intervene directly with policy conditionality the way the West has. Instead, we see them trying to hedge their risk differently. They hedge their risk with commercial conditions, right? Things like commodity guarantees and land guarantees. So the tools have changed over time. So we can get into sort of the implications of these changes in tools over time in the Q&A later. I wanna quickly share with you uh, just some charts as I leave here. Uh, just to give you a sense of some of these trends. So right here, you can see the trend, particularly since the global financial crisis uh, of China right now becoming one of the top five creditors, international bank creditors uh, throughout the globe, right? We can also see, and this is very important when thinking about these commercial ties as well, we can see that in the region, a big portion historically, right? If you looked at the Inter-American Dialogue data, right, that Margaret um, publishes, you'll see that in the last year or so, right, a lot of these state-to-state -state loans in a time of COVID have kind of just dropped off in terms of new loans. That being said, there's still a lot of loans outstanding. And it matters from this policy trade-off I mentioned, whether those loans are going through the state or whether they're more market-oriented, right? Uh, Latin America, historically, a lot of it has gone to the state. Now, China's known for its experimentation, and they have lots of sort of other mechanisms that are more market-based that then they're gravitating towards a little bit more. But you can see the trade-off here. Historically, with these state-to-state -state loans, 
right? Prior to the global financial crisis, prior to China entering the scene, as you see in the blue, we see budgetary surpluses in the region, even among left governments, right? In this graph, you see Argentina, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Venezuela, a whole range of left governments who still see budgetary surpluses, right? As China starts lending, right, you start to see budget deficits go up in the region. Not surprisingly, after a financial crisis, right, we see deficits expand, but they're sustained over time. And very quickly before I go, now you can see the trade off, the other side of it. So countries may get more room to maneuver with their macro policy, but with the mac micro policy, we see the number one here, we see Chinese commercial conditions. The number one basically highlights, oh, are there commercial conditions like tied aid with firms, machinery, right? Contracts along those lines. The number two highlights, are there commodity backed loans, right? Are there land guarantees and this kind of thing? And what we see, the gray is state to state loans. With more state to state loans, we see not only more commercial conditions, but specifically those oriented towards hedging risks, risk, such as commodity backed loans, resource loans, and land. So you can see the trade off clearly. You get macro policy maneuverability, but at the cost of commercial conditions, right? That might intensify the region's longstanding problems, such as dependency, industrial stagnation, and growing debt. Um, so that's sort of the general preview. Happy to delve into the, uh, those tools and those patterns in more detail later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Kaplan. I felt I was taken back to my GW days. <laughs> uh, well, but I'm now, very sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Very, very interesting still. So, <laughs> so Benjamin, if you want to give us some of your remarks. I'd be happy to. Thanks so much. So I'm going to focus on a more recent trend, which is the Chinese response in Latin America to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think what you'll see here, as you've seen in a lot of um, domestic and international trends, is an acceleration of some of what we've already heard from Margaret and Stephen in terms of Chinese influence and the relevance of China as both an economic and a diplomatic partner in Latin America. The first thing to know, as Sophia, you mentioned early on, is the devastating impacts of the pandemic in Latin America. I think you know it's easy to overlook that because it's obviously had grave impacts within the United States and, and worldwide, but Latin America has been the hardest hit region, both in terms of the public health impacts and in terms of the economic impacts. And so this was a region that was highly vulnerable um, to the pandemic and had very little capacity to respond. The public health sector in Latin America before the pandemic was already not up to the task, a lot of unequal access, very high levels of out-of-pocket spending, almost no capacity to produce medical devices and equipment at home, um, and again, very unequal in terms of income inequality in rural versus urban areas. As you could imagine what I'm going to say next, all of this made it very poorly positioned to be able to manage the response to the pandemic, even though the region had a few months to, to watch it play out first in in Europe and then in the United States, and still when it hit Latin America for reasons we don't need to get into now, but it spread very quickly and it created a sense of real urgency for the international community to step up and to support this region. As you know, what I'm describing now um, was not just in the first phases of the pandemic, but is going on even as we speak. Vaccinations in the region have rolled out very slowly in most places other than, than Chile, and we're seeing another wave of viral spread. And so everything I'm saying to you right now um, from the very beginning of this pandemic is even more so true today. And I'll get to what vaccine diplomacy looks like at the end. So you have a public health system that's ill-equipped to manage it, very high levels of corruption and poor access, and who steps up but, but the Chinese. A sense of the motivations, you know, it's hard to pin down exactly. You could attribute it to humanitarian concerns. You could attribute it to a decision to address potential negative consequences for Chinese image from its association with the early spread of the vaccine. You could say that it's South South camaraderie, or you could say that it's a, a desire to find markets for Chinese equipment and medicines. You could say that they're selling some of these things and not donating them. So as usual with China, the, the motivations are obscure and, and you, know, you could try to determine why. What is indisputable is the role that China did play in the region's response. So while the United States played very little part in trying to help the region address 
what was going on. And the reasons for that uh, are many. One was a posture um, that I think fit into an America first style. Um, the withdrawal from the World Health Organization, export controls on many of these products that the Chinese ended up providing to the region. Um, U.S. embassies in the region that had skeletal staffs because folks were sent home because of the pandemic, or, and those skeletal staffs were mostly focused on repatriating Americans who were found stranded around the world and needed to come home. So for all those reasons, the United States was not a player. The Chinese, very nimbly at so-called China speed, were sending massive amounts of, of PPE to Latin America, providing ventilators throughout the region, very responsive, whether from the government itself or the embassies and consulates, providing the mechanisms to make purchases from the Chinese private sector. And China was in a great position to do so because it managed to control the pandemic very quickly and because it was already the workshop of the world for much of these supplies. So the manufacturing capacity absent in Latin America, very um, under-equipped in the United States and in Europe was very much present already in China. And China was able to even ramp up be above this very strong base in the medical sector. And so China was able to do this. I've mentioned some of the many motivations, but again, the part that I think is most important to understand is that Latin America now recognizes that China was the key actor in the very beginning of this very devastating public health and economic period. This was the so-called medical diplomacy that you've heard so much about and you've heard about it worldwide. Now, the Chinese during this period also made a, a promise of a $1 billion loan to Latin America for vaccine purchases. This was before it was clear that China would have one, two, or any vaccines that were effective and safe against COVID-19. But again, it was a gesture that the Chinese were taking seriously the needs of their partners across the ideological and geographic spectrum in Latin America, and doing so again at a time where even if you add up the responses from the Southern Command, from USAID, from PRM, the Population, Refugees, and Migration um, Bureau at the State Department, where the US was, again, very slow out of the gate and almost not a relevant actor for quite a few months during the worst parts of this pandemic. Now, the, the important question I think quickly probably already is for you and will be for those observing this, is what will be the long-term impacts of this? So is there a time that we can envision that we won't be talking about it because the, the pandemic will be over and other players will have stepped up? And I think it's an important question because I would say, you know, the story is not done when it comes to medical diplomacy. The United States has now donated $2 billion to the COVAX program, which is the World Health Organization's vaccine distribution initiative and has promised an additional $2 billion. Millions of doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine have been provided to Mexico, and there's already pressure to do so in Northern Central America to reduce migration to the United States and also to make sure that those who are arriving are less likely to be infected with COVID-19. And so what I would stress is that I think the story is too early to conclude whether the role of the US was too inadequate as to have even further accelerated China's growing influence in the region. But I will say that so far, now that we've shifted into vaccine diplomacy, yet again, it is the Chinese who are the first uh, movers in Latin America. There's one vaccine already with, with millions of doses purchased by the Mexicans, the Brazilians, the Uruguayans. Again, importantly, this is across the political spectrum in the region. There's a second Chinese vaccine that's been deemed effective and, and safe and is already being purchased. So while the United States sort of tries to get to the point where supply exceeds demand, the Chinese are continuing to deepen their response and the reputation as having been the country that stepped up in this really difficult moment. I'll just conclude by saying that I'm talking about vaccine diplomacy and medical diplomacy, but it's also the Chinese economy recovering much faster than lots of other big economies in the world that are increasing the price of Latin American commodities, particularly in South America. And to the extent the region is recovering the sluggish, it's also highly attributable to China. And so that economic impact on the region will also compound this factor of, of how history may view China's role in Latin America's survival during this very difficult period. Thank you for so much for those remarks. I think we can all tell there's a lot of things to consider right now. So Paulina, if you wanna go next. Thank you so much uh, to all the organizers, to the Honor Institute at the GW University and to everyone uh, being willing to share their Sunday night uh, with us. So maybe a little caveat that would be interesting for you guys to know. I'm not an academic. I don't come from a university. I work with an NGO uh, or most of our work actually is coordinating with uh, local communities, uh, local NGOs that are monitoring and documenting 
environmental and social impacts in the context of the Chinese projects in the region. So the remarks that I have been asked to share with you have to do with environmental and social issues and with the, the possibilities of uh, China becoming an important player uh, on green development, green energy. Uh, I would like to start saying that we very much appreciate what China is doing in providing uh, financing and building wind and solar energy projects in the region. And uh, we, we think there is a lot of problems actually also with this. We will talk about uh, later people are interesting to know. But uh, we, we do think that the main challenge for actually achieving green financing and green development for Latin America is that governments have been always hungry for high and fast income like the revenues that are provided by fossil fuels and extractive industries in general. And sadly, many times at a high environmental and social cost. Uh, it seems pretty clear that with the pandemic and the huge economic impact that uh, my co-speakers have explained it, uh, the region will turn again to the extractive industries. I think we all have heard from Ecuador, from Brazil, from Peru, from Colombia, from Venezuela about their plans to increase mining, oil and large scale agribusiness activities and exports as part of their reactivation plans. I think it's very scary, especially because it's happening in a context where national environmental regulatory frameworks are falling apart environmental regulatory agencies, budgets and authority are being reduced. Indigenous communities are suing companies and governments for lack of consultation. And we should not forget that Latin America is getting quite violent. violent. In fact, uh, it has the highest level of murders of environmental defenders in the world. I have little doubt and much concern that Chinese banks and companies will be very interested in strengthening and expanding their presence in those extractive industries using a variety of financial vehicles. Uh, my concern has nothing to do with the nationality of the banks or the companies. It has to do with the fact that environmental governance in the region is in a critical condition and that Chinese banks have not yet developed a strong and mandatory safeguards to evaluate and to manage environmental and social risks, neither the necessary criteria for selecting truly green projects or prioritizing them in their investments portfolio. It is remarkable to me that not even the China Developed Bank, one of the most important banks in the world and definitely for Latin America, doesn't even have a, a mean for communities to present their complaints. There is no public accountability at all. In short, uh, in our view, what we are facing in Latin America is a, a scenario where the most powerful decision makers, those of course are the governments, but also the fin financiers and the companies are not yet well equipped to properly handling big scale extractive industries and ensuring a green recovery. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for that that introduction. So, of course, I think there's a lot of topics to cover with China. There's so many things that we could touch tonight. I'm going to ask a few questions and I would appreciate if you guys could keep your answers sort of short so we can go through as many topics as possible. I know this can be sort of hard, um, but I think that right now, one of the most relevant questions that could be asked is about the impact of like the tensions of between US and China relations that we have seen in the past week with new sanctions against Chinese officials. And so my first question is, how do you think, like, how do you guys think um, that the Biden administration is going to address China's growing influence in Latin America? Do we think that the new sanctions against Chinese officials are gonna affect the region? Or do we think that like, if the Biden the administration places new sanctions against Venezuela, how is the region going to react? So I don't know if anyone wants to take a first stab at it. Just okay, I'll, I'll try very briefly and then and then defer to my colleagues. 
I think the, the region has zero interest in choosing between the United States and China and has made it clear, first of all, sort of voting with their feet. I think Mary's Margaret pointed out in recent years, participation in the Belt and Road Initiative runs across ideological lines, um, participation in the Asian Investment in Infrastructure Bank. Um, so I think, you know, even recognition of Taiwan versus China, it seems very clear that the region has an interest in maintaining relations with both. I think the Biden administration recognizes that, and its approach will be to offer alternatives to Chinese finance versus trying to coerce or persuade governments in the region to choose between the United States and China. We'll see how long that's viable and if the region can avoid the notion of being caught between these two major powers in great power competition, but I think the going in position for the region is not to choose and for the new administration is not to compel countries to choose, but rather to offer new tools so that the US can be the preferred partner. Professor Kaplan. <laughs> well, I saw Margaret had a hand up, so no, Margaret, go ahead, go ahead. I'll follow, okay. <laughs> uh, it, it's the same type of theme, right? That I think effectively the region is looking to triangulate. Right. And you talk to policymakers within the region, and that's a goal, right? They're, they want to bring in capital, they want to bring in financing, they don't want to choose between the two. Um, and so given that backdrop, that puts the onus in a lot of ways on the United States to develop an alternative vision, right? And, and specifically, that is an attractive vision that can sort of compete with the Chinese vision and the Chinese opportunity. Um, and so from that standpoint, I think the Build Act, right, which sort of looks to dedicate uh, private sector capital of the region and create incentives for that is a good starting point, but there needs to be a lot more of that. And in some ways I see, you know, I mentioned before, there's two channels, right, that Chinese financing could come to the region in. In some ways, there's an incentive for China to diversify out of the state to state to mitigate the risk. At the same time, the United States can build off that incentive, right, and actually help Latin American countries build sort of that market channel more, right? And support that market channel. And even give an incentive for China to go via that market channel more. And then perhaps the kind of outcomes that Paulina is talking about in terms of right now, if it's state to state, you get obscured fine print. Maybe if it goes to the market, open bidding, more transparency, maybe some of that comes to light a bit more. Maybe an indigenous voice comes to light a bit more. Um, so that would be sort of my starting point there. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> Uh, no, thank you so much. Yeah, so I, I mean, frankly, I don't think, uh, and this is a bit of a defeatist perspective, so apologize for that in, in advance, but that, you know, that the Biden administration or the Trump, that any of these, you know, administrations um, have a plethora of options, right, in terms of competing effectively with China in the region. There is the Build Act, which can be, you know, utilized, I think, more effectively. Um, there are things that can be done, especially in terms of building capacity, which I think are really quite critical. I mean, some of that happened during the Trump administration. I think that that particular sort of, you know, um, focus, you know, with, with embassies carrying out trainings or, or working to support organizations, civil society, or, you know, certain government organizations that are responsible for accountability. Um, uh, to strengthen, you know, free press in, in these countries and, and ensure that there is sufficient reporting, not just on Chinese projects, but on, you know, wide ranging projects and in, in, in uh, you know, either environmentally sensitive or otherwise sensitive sectors. These things are, are really quite important. So, I mean, that is something that can be done, that can be built upon, and I think needs to be thought about in even uh, greater, greater depth. But um, what I mean, what I would caution against, right, and I'm seeing some of this already is a tendency to make these blanket statements about the China threat, right? Um, uh, because as I think a lot of us have alluded to, it, kind of, it, it falls on deaf ears in, in Latin America because Latin Americans frankly have a very different experience with, with China than, than the US does and historical experience that is, right? And, and there is a great need to engage with China economically speaking, especially coming out of this pandemic. So um, it's not to say that there aren't things that may be concerning, right? But perhaps this is done in, in a different way and with you know sufficient evidence um, at hand. So I think there there are ways, perhaps with with respect to the messaging, to to, to rethink a lot of these things. Yeah, I, I also would like to share something that probably some of you are already following is the framework agreement that the International Financial Corporation from the US uh, signed it with the Ecuadorian government in February. 
This a framework, a framework agreement, I think it's a little bit more than a billion, but it's interesting to see that in that context of the US uh, pushing the governments to choose. And I think it's, uh, uh, what happened with this agreement will be a learning experience for the region. What is uh, proposed by the United States is to provide that loan to Ecuador, but there are some conditionalities. And in my experience, at least it's the first time that we see a uh, financial institutions from uh, the United States uh, uh, exerting that kind of pressure. Basically, the agreement said that uh, Ecuador will be uh, able to use the, those fund, funds uh, to pay back part of the debt with China. And under the, the, the agreement that Ecuador would not use any of the Chinese companies that have been banned in the United States. And that, uh, that is concerning, I think, for the policy point of view. Uh, and it will be good to be attentive and to see what happened with that. Thank you so much. So I want to move back a little on the current, like talk about COVID-19, because I'm sure our audience joined to talk about that. But um, so how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the long-term long relations with China? Is China taking advantage of the region's economic, public health, and security crisis to further entrench itself in the region? I don't know if who wants to go. I can. I mean, yeah, Benjamin you. has done such a great job of already covering some of the the main yes. points about this. But I would say, you know, one effect, and 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 Stephen alluded to this too, right? Is that it, We've seen a, a decline in Chinese policy bank, right, state to state finance since around 2015, and we saw no new finance in 2020. And so that was one result, right? I think not attributable just to the COVID-19 crisis, but certainly there, countries weren't work, looking to do, you know, large scale public works projects or certainly weren't announcing those, you know, in 2020 in the midst of the crisis. Um, and Chinese companies or Chinese banks were looking just to keep, you know, Belt and Road projects sort of running, right? Those in existence already. So the focus was otherwise. Whether things will materialize in 2021 or not is still sort of remains to be seen. We might see this $1 billion loan, right, that was mentioned for in, in support of the provision of Chinese vaccine. We might see an agreement with Ecuador, depending upon what happens with that US loan and, and some negotiations ongoing with, with Ecuador. Pauline, I'm sure you know a lot more about that than I do. But in any case, there's not going to be a ton. We're not going to see the numbers that we saw, you know, in 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 2010 or in the, the sort of you know peak years of Chinese finance in Latin America. But uh, nevertheless, that was one one you know uh, I think important financial you know effect um, of all of this. And I'll stop stop there. Thank you. Does anyone want to take a step on that question, or I can just move on to another one? If that works. Okay, so then I'm gonna focus on like I'm gonna ask for the sake of time. We I this is gonna be the last question that I ask, and then so if anyone from the audience wants to ask um, questions, they can submit them to Elad, and then he'll pass them on to me. But my last question focuses on the environment. Um, so in recent years, China has become a larger consumer of beef and pork, increasing their respect in consumption by 40 and 30% between 2011 and 2018. How do we expect growing demands from China for these and other natural resources to affect Latin America? As China's population continues to grow in the following decades, how do we expect its consumer needs to affect global warming? And I already got a question from the audience that's tied to the environment linked to this um, and it ties ties into this and it has been what has been the environmental impact of China's growing natural resources consumptions in Latin America. Professor Kaplan. Well I think one thing to you know have the region have it, its eye on moving forward is you know, commodity dependence, as mentioned uh, in my opening, has kind of been an, a long-standing issue for the region. And there's been progress over time, right, and particularly some of the major markets, uh, the Brazil, the Mexico, the Argentinas, in terms of diversifying those industrial relations. And so the risk here, right, if you think about so many of the loans, right, even though, right, you have sort of less of a flow, as we've talked about in this last year, you have a lot of indebtedness that's still been built up, right, and you have underlying conditions related to commodity sectors, to land, right? 
And then at the same time, you have China trying to promote uh, capital input side of the relationship. And so the, the, the risk is, is that this long-standing commodity dependency for the region gets ex exacerbated moving forward. And so China is clearly aware of that, this and long-standing negotiations with Brazil and other countries. There's always talk of complementarities. And we do see increased FDI related to, like slightly increased FDI related to manufacturing in places like Brazil, but it's not a broad theme throughout the region, right? And so I think one of the really long-term issues for the region beyond COVID moving forward is really to how to keep up this industrial diversification, right? And obviously it's not only important from environmental sustainability and resource standpoint, but also from a broader development standpoint then as well. Thank you, Paulina. Yeah, uh, I would like us actually to, to remark our concerns about the, the fragile environmental regulatory frameworks in the region. And I think Brazil is a very good example of what is happening uh, with the government of Bolsonaro. Uh, I think maybe more than any countries, uh, there are less warranty for the environment. Uh, indigenous uh, lands have been open for mining, for agribusiness without consultation. I think uh, the public policy in Brazil is very, very aggressive to open uh, lands in the Amazon for agribusiness, for uh, uh, big uh, infrastructure for extractives. And I think uh, it's going to, going to have a big impact uh, in the conservation of the Amazon. And if we see overall the, the concentration of big projects uh, that are uh, inherent, have inherent in big environmental and social impacts, many of them are actually with Chinese participation, Chinese companies, Chinese uh, financing, and are located in very sensible areas, socially and environmental. I don't think that. Uh, uh, changing anytime soon. Even if we don't see many more projects coming, we have to remember that those oil projects, those mining projects are 25 years uh, contracts that can be renovated. So we really, really need uh, Chinese uh, actors to become more uh, environmental responsible. Thank you, Paulina, Margaret. I'll be very quick just to follow on on you know on Paulina's point I wanted to point out that you know on the Chinese side there's something of a like in China you say maldun right this contradiction wherein you have a, a the leadership espousing a you know a very clear commitment to certain climate related standards to you know reducing uh, carbon footprint to you know to ecological civilization and a wide range of other terms that are used in Chinese policy right to articulate these these goals and aims and commitments um, and indeed I mean as Paulina mentioned on the ground we do see a lot more investment especially over the past two years in particular especially through acquisitions but also some greenfield investment in renewable energy right and so they are uh, China is an important partner to, to the region in that respect uh, although there are as Paulina mentioned problems with some of those investments as well but um you know you see that and then you see you look at the entire fdi picture you know and steven sort of alluded to this and you see that most of it is still concentrated in these sectors that have as we all noted you know noted outsize in um impact right uh from an environmental perspective and so much will depend, I think, looking post COVID-19, right, there are going to be a lot, a lot of opportunities for Chinese acquisitions and for other sorts of investments. Um, it will be a, an, an environment where Chinese companies, which are better positioned than many other companies across the world, are able to invest, I think, fairly freely. And so we'll see where that investment goes, just how serious China is about some of these environmental, uh, you know, commitments and, you know, it, but much, I think, still remains to be seen. Thank you. So I have my first audience question, and this is directed towards you, Margaret. Um, so considering the recent offer made by Chinese officials to provide vaccines to Paraguay in exchange for Paraguay for Paraguay and shifting diplomatic recognition from Taipei to Beijing, what is the ability of Taiwan to maintain its alliances in Latin America in the pandemic context and afterwards? I mean, yeah, I mean, certainly this is not just a, you know, COVID-19 era problem for, for Taiwan, you know, and starting in 
really, really much has to do with who's the president of Taiwan at any given moment, right? And ever since Tsai Ing-wen was elected in 2016, we've seen from a party, you know, that is much more pro-independence, uh, we've seen a rise in, in, in Chinese activity and Chinese efforts to try to convert, um, you know, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's existing allies in the region um, to encourage them to cut ties with Taiwan and establish them with mainland China. Uh, this started in 2017 with Panama, then we saw the Dominican Republic cut ties in 2018, and then we saw Panama cut ties, um, or rather uh, El Salvador cut ties in 2018 as well. And so now, you know, it's not as though this, this activity has stopped. <laughs> it's taken different forms. There have been a lot of offers, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, during the pandemic. Um, there are indeed a lot of, you know, a, a, a lot of people in Ecuador, uh, different groups in Ecuador, uh, especially agricult the agricultural sector, right, is, that is very much in, or no, I'm sorry, I'm talking about Ecuador, Paraguay that is very much in support of, um, you know, of, of cutting ties with Taiwan in order to establish them with China. They, they see a tremendous opportunity in terms of engaging more extensively economically with China. And that is indeed the motivation for all of these countries. Much will depend, um, I think, more in the sort of Northern Triangle than in Paraguay on US policy on this, on whether the US, you know, determines uh, to, to take some, you know, very, hard stance um, or to, uh, you know, to in some way, uh, you know, work with the Northern Triangle countries to prevent more, uh, you know, uh, affiliation with, with or rather dil diplomatic ties with China from happening. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the, the outlook doesn't look particularly in the long term, at least um, positive for, for Taiwan, frankly speaking. Although I will say that, you know, when you look at the benefits, right, to the countries that have cut ties, they really are quite wide ranging. You know, some have, Panama struck something like 16 deals, about six of those have been canceled, but nevertheless, that leaves you with about 10 deals in, in, in the infrastructure sector, right? Um, and the other hand, you know, El Salvador has walked away with essentially a boardwalk, right? At this point, there may be more that that, that materializes, and then Costa Rica too is a case where not a, not a whole lot really did result from that, you know, really very strategic decision. Thank you for that. So um, now I have a question about the environment, and is directed towards Benjamin and Paulina. So. Recently, lithium demand for, from China and multinational corporations have risen rapidly. Many countries in the region, including Bolivia and Mexico, have sponsored legislation to nationalize lithium mines. Can you please expand on the potential implications of lithium nationalization in the context of increased foreign demand in mining concessions? Sure, Paulina, if that's okay, I'll, I'll give a couple thoughts. Um, so, you know, for those of you who don't follow lithium, it's the key ingredient um, in rechargeable batteries that, you know, historically been used for things like cellular phones, but increasingly are used for electric vehicles, um, including, you know, for all sorts of commercial purposes and buses, but also in the kinds of batteries needed for utility scale renewable energy. So it's, it's pretty critical to the renewable energy transformation globally and more than half of the world's lithium is in Latin America, principally in South America, in Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. And Bolivia, for the reasons that the questioner has just referenced, is actually not really producing um, commercially its lithium because it has envisioned a very significant role for the state. Mexico is just now thinking about nationalization, but it also is not a serious player. It's mostly been Argentina and Chile, including through significant investment from Chinese companies. China, I think, produces something like 60% of the world's lithium ion batteries, and so takes the lithium from places like South America and brings it to China for, for producing batteries to meet all of this increasing global demand. I think that, you know, for our purposes, I think that's the interesting issue, which is China's huge role in lithium in Latin America compared to what may be a changing posture from the US government, which under the Trump administration declared lithium a strategic resource. And so started thinking about ways that the United States could look at not only domestically, but 
but overseas and friendly places like Latin America assure the sustainable production of lithium. So I think you're going to see more of an interest from the U.S. government in having U.S. firms be bigger players in, in Latin America instead of deferring to all this Chinese investment. The question of the role of the state is a chronic one in Latin America. They don't have time to get into. I think the issues will not only be the you know, resource nationalism with the production of lithium, but sometimes unrealistic ideas for moving up the value chain where every country in Latin America wants to produce batteries and electric vehicles and not only to produce lithium. And so this sort of obsession with value added, which makes sense in the long term, is not exactly um, going to be the most productive way to approach producing in the short term when the um, opportunities will be really extraordinary given post-pandemic sort of build back better ideas in, in the US and Europe. I don't have much to add actually to what Benjamin said, because if we learn what happened with other um, strategic industries like uh, electricity, like fossil fuels, we don't see that the nationalization is uh, really uh, making any difference in terms of the environment. I don't see uh, national companies behaving much better or much worse actually than international companies. It's all about the strength of the national environment and the uh, capacity of governments to really execute and implement good laws. And that doesn't much to do with private or public companies. Thank you so much, Professor Kaplan. So as China rebalances by reducing foreign investments, do Latin American countries still have to be more wary of potentially falling into debt traps? Moreover, is it fair to characterize Chinese investments in the region as an example of debt trap diplomacy? Great, thank you very much. Uh, so in terms of the debt trap meme, uh, I'm very skeptical of uh, such memes as a debt trap because if you look at the empirics, in countries like Venezuela and what's happened, it goes, it undermines the logic of the debt trap, right? So the debt trap would suggest that China purposely, right? Benjamin was talking about motivations before, purposely goes in, lends with the expectation that a country will become more indebted and then they can have an asset grab, right? But if you look at what's happened, particularly in countries like Venezuela since 2014, right? The exact opposite pattern has happened where Effectively, I would argue it's been much more of a creditor trap, right? Where China, which is moving up the learning curve in terms of its, its investments, realize it's mispriced risk, right? As kind of a new creditor globally, and has actually tried to deleverage in Venezuela, but not only Venezuela, right? If you look across Latin America right now, in a lot of ways, right, China's defensively lending, right? It's restructuring old loans, not only with Venezuela, um, Ecuador. Right, it looks like Bolivia uh, might be next in line as well, and so effectively, you know, you do have a situation that's much more one of I would characterize as China's kind of been learning about the region and at times mispriced risk. They figured, right? We talked about the commodity guarantees before. They figured they could mitigate risk with things like commodity and land guarantees, right? A similar model that they use domestically, and in fact, right, in a lot of countries, still ended up very exposed to sovereign risk. So now importantly, what we're seeing to answer the second part of that question is increasingly a desire of China to diversify that risk, to use more market tools. The financing is still state backed, still coming from policy banks, but you have sort of 40 billion some odd dollars that has been sort of headlined, earmarked uh, for the notion of kind of investing through private equity in the region. That being said, uh, when I was doing my field research and talking with a lot of folks that were running uh, these investment groups, uh, this investment facility, effectively, right, they had highlighted in January 2020 that only about two, two and a half billion dollars of that has actually been allocated, right? And so it tends to be much smaller figures <laughs> um, that are oriented directly into equity, uh, but also in terms of what the facilities envision or how China envisions perhaps eventually those facilities being used, you know, not that much capital has been implemented to date. Now, already we heard Benjamin as well as Margaret talk about COVID, but just to bring in, in terms of my interviews from last year, another dimension was actually tensions between the US and China, right? We tend to think about, oh, in the West that, oh, well, China's monolithically trying to control, right, all these ties. But in fact, when you start interviewing people who are supposed to be with these state funds, investing in a way that's very market oriented, 
there's also sort of a lot of fear of these US-China tensions, right? And it creates uncertainty. Um, and then that uncertainty creates sort of investment environment where, well, some of these people running the funds aren't sure uh, whether they should kind of dedicate a lot of money uh, towards Latin America or not, right? So it's not only, I think, uncertainty from COVID, but also uncertainty from US-China relations, right? And so the extent to which we see, and we haven't yet to date, but if we see a mitigating of some of those tensions over the Biden administration, I would actually anticipate you see some of those tools, particularly the market-based tools, used a bit more frequently. Thank you so much. So for the sake of time, I'm just gonna ask a quick question to just add closing remarks and just maybe if you could give us an idea of where you see Beijing focusing on lat like in la Latin American relations in the next decade. If anyone wants to go at it first. Um, Professor Kaplan. No, actually, last time in our tango, I went first, so now it's Margaret's turn. <laughs> <laughs> so be it. Thank you. I, I didn't see your hand. I'm so no, sorry. I just, saw, I just saw everyone unmute their their microphones at the same time, and I just not saw. A problem, not a problem. No, no. I'll, I, I would just say, you know, look when you there is no doubt that there is at least a very strong high level policy commitment to advancing the objectives of the Belt and Road Initiative. Of course, the objectives of the Belt and Road Initiative are ever evolving, right, and are related to China's, in many cases, own, you know, domestic economic priorities and, and you know, foreign policy interests. So, uh, you know, much will depend on how the Belt and Road itself evolves over time. But what we've seen in the past, you know, year or two is a really extensive focus on you know, the, the health Silk Road, and that predates, you know, COVID-19, but was sort of resurrected in 2020, um, and on the digital Silk Road. And so those two areas, I don't imagine the health Silk Road going anywhere, even, you know, as COVID-19 ideally sort of resolves in, in, in the region or, or goes away. But, um, uh, you know, I think we'll see a lot more emphasis on sort of ph pharmaceuticals related investment on, you know, cooperation, technical cooperation and wide range of, of you know, uh, biotech and, 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 and other industries. Um, already that's happening, right, in, in Brazil and a number of other places. And so I think we should expect that to continue. Same in the tech, a broader tech sphere, right? This is an area where we are seeing extensive investment. I expect a lot more of that in 2021, in part because you see quicker returns on those investments than on these sort of large scale, you know, major infrastructure projects of the sort that China's done historically. So um, quite a lot of that. And another, you know, I, I mentioned this already, but I think we'll see a surge in acquisitions in very specific sectors, right? I think, again, renewable technology, uh, renewable energy, tech, um, and uh, electricity transmission is another area where, you know, China has become a very dominant player in certain parts of the region, including the south of Peru, for example, parts of Brazil, um, and, you know, possibly other, you know, other acquisitions of ports and things like that that have been of interest to China for, for a number of years now. So I think these, these things, which have indeed been features of the BRI, may, may continue to be emphasized, along with some newer, newer sort of elements. And, uh, yeah, I'll just stop there so others have a chance to, to respond. Thank you so much. Now, Professor Kaplan. <laughs> sure, I would agree with Margaret in terms of the discourse, right, and the overtures. I think from that standpoint, China is very clear about where it wants to go and where sort of the past may have been sort of heavy infrastructure. Uh, now they're very much looking to long-term digital infrastructure, digital economy, uh, you know, diversifying banking, right, mergers and acquisitions in specific targeted sectors as Margaret's highlighting. I'll add another dimension to that that I think is really key, uh, and that's renminbi internationalization, right? Um, just like they've had these overtures in terms of where they wanna go with the region in terms of digital economy, et cetera, uh, health as well, we have longstanding overtures and facilities oriented towards renminbi internationalization. Given the commodity focus of the region to date, right, a lot of the business tends to be in, a lot of the settlement tends to be in dollars, but nonetheless, we've had a lot of you know, institution building in terms of central bank swaps. Uh, we now see some of the commercial, quote, commercial banks from China coming in and also offering renminbi settlement locally as well. So we're starting to see facilities put in place in order to increase transaction renminbis over the long run. Um, and so I would expect that, you know, um, investments are also going to be oriented to try to 
uh, use the renminbi more and more in the region in order to kind of fulfill that long-term policy goal of a renminbi internationalization as well. So we should see more of that within the region too. Thank you. Paulina? Uh, after what uh, Stefan and Margaret said, it's difficult to, to give a more accurate uh, perspective of what could happen. But I would like to say what I, I would like to see happening. I think China, more than many other countries in the world, have been very prolific about uh, promulgating issuing uh, a number of environmental and social guidelines. Uh, lately, uh, China is also issuing a number of laws and measures to improve their assessment of reput uh, reputational risks, their environment uh, and risk assessment. And I think there is a lot of good material in the books. What I would like to see is those putting into practice. I it will be great to see the banks and the companies creating the systems, the tools, the, the staff uh, providing budgets to make those good commitments happen in Latin America and starting also to engage with uh, civil society in Latin America. Uh, maybe a little uh, piece of good news to share is that there has been an announcement from the Chinese Banking and Insurance Regulation Commission about um, the launching of a grievance mechanism for the Chinese uh, banks. So luckily we will uh, see that happening at the end of the year, the beginning of next year, and that could be for sure a good platform to communicate with China. Thank you, Benjamin. Yeah, I would say, I think it'll be interesting to see whether China remains as agnostic about governance as it has been historically. I think it will remain increasingly agnostic about regime type and about regime ideology in Latin America, which is to say lending and deepening relations across geographies and ideologies. I do think that the experience in Venezuela was quite scarring for the Chinese, and I think it, it explains some of what Margaret and others have observed with the steep decline in state-to-state -state lending. Stephen has written a lot about this as well, the idea of sort of piggybacking on conditionality from international institutions or finding other ways, even if it isn't traditional concerns about budget deficits to try to make sure that the governments that China is dealing with are actually going to be able to continue to, to finance this debt or at least to produce the commodities that are meant to um, protect China against sovereign risk. So I think one thing that'll be interesting to watch over time is as China becomes more diversified in the mechanisms for lending in the region, does it also show an increasing interest in governance questions, having again learned the lessons from its extraordinary lending in Venezuela and, and a, a situation that not only has you know, financial implications for China, but reputational risk as well. I know Paulina has talked about reputational risk when it comes to its environmental footprint, but there's also reputational risk when it comes to having, you know, provided financing for projects that simply fail or for governments that end up quite isolated within the Western Hemisphere in Europe. Thank you so much. I'm sure we have all learned a lot about the current state of the relations between China and Latin America today. I know there's a lot to cover, but I think you gave us a glimpse into your insights, which we greatly appreciate. Um, with that, I'm gonna pass it to a lad who's gonna end us off for the night. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you so much. And thank you to Sophia for a wonderful job moderating. We really appreciated you ha having you here. And thank you again to our speakers, to everyone that made this event possible. Uh, and to all of you for joining. Uh, so those of you who have come to Foreign Affairs with Future Leaders in the past, you'll know that at the end of every event, we love to ask everyone to turn their cameras on if they feel comfortable and take a big group photo together. So I'll give a couple seconds for anyone who feels that they'd like to, to turn their cameras on. Uh, feel free to go ahead, we'd love to see you. And again, we're just really thankful to have you all here. I'll give a couple more seconds. In the meantime, you'll, you may notice that I've left a couple of links in the chat. Uh, one of them is our next uh, event, which is coming up in April, which we'll be talking in which we'll be talking about uh, spycraft and international law. Another very interesting topic, uh, and of course, you see the information of the different organizations that help put this together. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and count us off. So everyone, big smiles. One, two, three, four, five, six. Got it. Excellent. Well, thanks again for everyone coming, and thank you to our speakers to uh, the Oner Institute, Delta Phi Epsilon Professional Foreign Service Attorney and Sorority, YGW, and the School for Ethics and Global Leadership. And again, to our speakers, we wish you all 
a pleasant night and a great end to your weekend and stay safe everyone bye have a good night take care thank you very much